gone half past, so we can make a start. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this FCI webinar on code health. Uh, very lucky to have uh, Aaron Schlossberg with us today presenting. Um, there's a bit of housekeeping uh, on the screen at the moment, which hopefully you can see. Um, and uh, yeah, Marcus, uh, I'll pass over to you to get us started. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Marcus Bohr. I'm a GP. I'm an um, FCI member and um, we are here today for uh, Aaron Schlossberg's uh, presentation on uh, code health for health code. Um, Aaron is an experienced software developer working for Google um, who describes himself as having a, the medical specialty of informatics. Um, he's a doctor uh, by training and has a previous life as a pathology trainee and his vision of uh, his role is bringing the worlds of the clinician together with the worlds of the technician and enabling that mutual understanding so that um, they can work together in a more productive way. Um, so bringing those worlds together is the kind of um, is the dream there. So um, he's going to talk to us this afternoon about um, code health for health code. And so uh, we'll, I, I think in terms of uh, housekeeping, uh, there is an evaluation form which we'll put in the chat at the end. Um, we will take questions at the end, unless they are sort of questions that particularly need asking right then and there with that with that part of the the um, presentation. So we can take questions sort of in line, and we will keep an eye on the chat and for people raising hands. But if you're just asking a general question, then we can um, save all those to the end, where there will be a a period of time for questions. Um, other than that, stay muted until the end. Uh, take it away, Aaron. Thank you very much, Marcus. Are my slides up in the presentation? Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Yep. Thank you for having me today. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming along. We're going to be talking about code health. Um, start off with what is this concept? It's probably pretty new for people, um, but it's very important. So what, why does it matter? What is important about it? And then the crux of this will be about how we can actually achieve this within software. Um, at the end, I'll leave some time for questions as well. I'm gonna be using a lot of analogies throughout, and that's because we have people with a range of different pre-existing or no knowledge of coding. You don't need to know anything ahead of time. And I'd like the talk to be accessible to everyone. So if you've never written a, or seen a line of code in your life, hopefully you'll learn something. And even if you do it quite regularly, hopefully I'll teach you something too, how to take it to the next level, to go from something you dabbled in to take it to something that's safe and better to use within healthcare. So what is this concept of code health? Um, it's not just a play on words so I could use in the title. It's actually a well-established concept. So I think healthy code can be summarized as within three different pillars. The first one is that the code is uncomplicated. I should be able to take your software, you should be able to take mine, immediately understand what I'm doing. Anyway. Um, immediately understand what the other person was intending to do and take over the project and move on from there. It's about communication of ideas from one software developer, programmer to another. So that's the first pillar. The second one is that it's easy to change the code over time. You don't get bogged down by the code that you've put in there in the first place. Part of that comes into being uncomplicated in that if something's easy to understand, you know the effects that they'll have, but it's also the way that things were structured. Even if you understand all the structure, if it's needlessly complicated, it makes it very difficult to change things in the future. And there's a great quote by Sandy Metz that says, design is the art of arranging code to work today, but be changeable forever. And that's what we're aiming at. And the final pillar that we have is that code is simple to fix. Computers don't make mistakes, humans make mistakes, and it's inevitable, we all do all of the time. Bugs happen on a regular basis. And we want to write our code in a way that it's easy to find them as quickly as possible. And when they are found as well, that it's very easy for the people who have to fix them to pinpoint the source as quickly as possible. So together, I would argue, at least for this talk, that these are the three pillars that make up healthy code. That's what we're gonna aim for and learn how to produce. So when you might sometimes hear this term called technical debt, and I'll define it as 
the work needed to correct unhealthy code. So to take something that is, you might sometimes hear the term spaghetti code, because it's a ball of spaghetti, everything mixed together. It's complicated, it's not easy to understand. Taking that from spaghetti code to healthy code, the delta there is the technical debt that we face. If there's one thing you take away from the talk today, I want it to be this. It's, you want your code to work, but just because it works, that's not enough. There needs to be more than that. It needs to be safe and robust. It needs to be manageable, and you need to be able to change it over time too. If there are any surgeons in the audience, a great analogy there is that you can perform an operation, but was it beautiful? Was it done in the best way that you can possibly imagine? And I think it's important to understand that I'm not a surgeon, I don't have surgical training, so I couldn't necessarily appreciate what you would see in an operation. The same thing will apply for code, but what I wanna do in this talk is show you what those things are that make a more beautiful piece of code. And this, this idea of like working code not being good enough, it's not just about production code that gets used on a day-to-day -day basis. I think this applies to research code as well. I don't mean right at the beginning when you're first dabbling and experimenting, but if you want to take your research code and use it for a paper, and you want that paper to stand up to scrutiny, you want the results to be reliable and trusted for patient care, and you want it to be re reproducible, then I think everything you learn today will help there as well. So we've got these three pillars, but how do we actually get to them? So how do we move towards healthier code? And today we'll delve into two ways that you can do that. The first one is clarity. So clarity reduces complication in your code. It makes it easy to understand, but it also makes it easy to evolve. If I pull this lever, if I turn this knob, this is what will happen because the code is clear and easy to understand. The other element is testing. We'll delve into what exactly testing of code is. And it's easy to see why testing applies to making code easy, simple to fix. If the code has a bug, testing is there to try and find it. But why does testing make code also easy to evolve? And we'll go into that in a lot more detail, but the short and simple part is that if you have tests in place, it means that if you pull the wrong lever, if you have a house of cards and you remove the wrong card, the tests are there to save you. They will be your safety net, which means you can experiment away the tests will be there to make sure you don't break anything if they've been written. We'll get to that in a moment. I want to make sure that nobody, it's, I'm not here just to, to blow the trumpet of, of code health just because I think it makes a good talk. I think this is important for everyone to understand. So let's go into why. And the main thing is there's preventable patient harm. There, a study by Martin et al published a couple of years ago reported that across NHS England and Wales in a 10 year period, there were 2,600 IT related incidents. Importantly, four of those resulted in patient death, 14 of them resulted in severe harm and 100 plus resulted in moderate harm. These are things that I haven't looked into the specifics of each case, but if any of these came from poorly written software, it is utterly and completely preventable. And that's what we're gonna try and aim to get with healthier code. The important thing with this study as well, that it may have been this number, but the, the authors state that they have strong belief, um, strong reason to believe that the numbers were likely underreported, so higher than what we see here. So why is clarity an important part of this? I said I'd draw analogies, and there's an analogy between clear code and patient handover. That's the way you can understand it. When a software engineer wants their code to be clear, not their code, when they want someone else's code to be clear, it's because they're like a clinician who wants a good patient handover. They want to know what's going on. And that's particularly important because code gets written only that one time. The very first time you write it, or when you change it, that new code is done once, but it's read so many times over and over again. When someone joins a new team, they have to understand what's going on. For anyone in the audience who writes code and has had to take over a colleague's project or written it in a group of people, adopting an old project that's a mess is, is really hard. 
And I think the worst thing that can possibly happen is you come up to some unhealthy code and you realize there's nobody to blame but yourself. And I've quoted this as every programmer ever at some point. I've done it. Everyone has done it. You work on a project for a little bit and you have this deep understanding of what's going on. You put it on the shelf and you come back six months later and you think to yourself, oh man, what, what's going on here? I, I just have no idea. And so when I talk about other programmers benefiting from this, it's also future you is another programmer. And there's some really good quotes around this. Hal Abelson and Gerald Sussman wrote, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. And another person, Gaston Horquera, wrote, the most important skill for a programmer is the ability to effectively communicate ideas. And that captures the whole essence of what I'm trying to say in clarity. We want to communicate the ideas not just to the computer who needs to interpret them, but to the other humans. So that's clarity. Why is testing important? A similar analogy to healthcare is you would never release a drug or a procedure or a, a protocol without a clinical trial. Same thing goes for software. This code should not be reaching patients and having an effect on them without some level of thorough coverage of tests. We'll go into what that means a bit later about coverage, but you'll see up here I write automated testing. Automated doesn't mean that the machine is writing the tests for you. Automated means that the machine is running the tests for you. We'll get into that a little bit later, but anyone here who's written some code will know that at some point they have printed an output to the screen, they've looked and they go, yeah, my code's working, that's good enough. The thing with an automated test that's different there is it guarantees this in the future. You pass it on to someone else at some, somewhere else and the code still keeps working. Similar thing that we've all said, but it works on my machine. And I think this is a, a really tough thing that you get with software of somebody reports a bug to you, you try and reproduce it, you try and fix it, and you just throw your hands in the air and say, I don't know what's wrong, it's working here. If you have automated tests, they can be checked on the, on the other person's side and you can, you can use them over there. And that overcomes that. So we've gone into what code health is, how we can achieve it, and why those specific things are important. And now we'll delve into the actual interesting bits, how we can get there. So this is deliberately written for everyone to understand. You don't need to be able to code to understand this. If you do code, there will be some snippets that you can look into and I'll run people through it. Don't try and memorize the things that I say here. I, if you want to take something from this, the talk will be recorded. So the best thing to do is try and just appreciate the effect that this has on improving the code and then come back later using the recording as a reference. And then you can see the specifics and really delve into it. When we're talking about clarity, I might sometimes call it readability out of, out of habit. How easy is it to read the code? It means the same thing. So how do we improve clarity? The, the number one central element is reducing cognitive load. Humans do not have the same kind of capacity and memory that a computer has, and we want to make it as easy and simple for them to understand. We can break this down into two elements. There's an intrinsic cognitive load for everything that we're doing, and an extrinsic cognitive load that we accidentally add and don't mean to, and that makes things more difficult for the people writing out, reading our code, sorry. It's this extrinsic con cognitive load that I'm gonna delve into to see how we can remove it from software. Because I want this, everyone to understand this, I'm gonna give just a language analogy. Anyone who's read or heard Steven Pinker will understand this immediately. Here's an, an analogous piece of extrinsic cognitive load from some UK legislation. The revocation by these regulations of a saving on the previous revocation of a provision, do, it's just not worth even reading it. There is, there is an idea that is captured in there somewhere that is lost because of extrinsic cognitive load. And the same thing can happen in software. So I'm gonna give some examples of what that is and how we can overcome it now. If there's one, the best way that you can get rid of cognitive load, increase clarity of your code is have someone else take a look at it. If the point is to make it easier to read, the best test is when someone else reads it, 
Is it easier for them? Do Have we successfully communicated our ideas? So at Google, but also many other software companies, even small ones, we have these things called code review. And what happens is anytime I write a piece of code, if I want to submit it and have it saved, some other engineer has to take a look at it. And they have to give me a polite, respectful critique. The idea is to look at the code itself, the end work, not of me as a person. And that's a difficult thing. It's a difficult balance to strike, but that's the goal. And by doing this and pro providing this critique of the code, they can actually gauge the clarity, tell me when things are unclear, and actually spot the mistakes that I make. And everybody learns in the process. Everybody has a slightly different style, slightly different approach. And by undergoing code review, everyone gets better. Um, it's actually possible to do this quite easily. The, the widely used code repositories like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, all include a code review feature. So when there's a, a pull request that comes in, a pull request is somebody saying, please accept my code, please pull it into your, into your repository. That's when you can undergo review. And it's a back and forth. You, you comment on the certain elements, certain design choices, and provide questions and comments. And it's actually okay to push back. If I write some code and Marcus says, I don't think you should do it like this. And I say, no, actually, this is the real, this is the reason. Even if Marcus agrees with that, the fact that he's had to question it in the first place suggests that there's some level of clarity that can be improved. What you can do for that is add clarifying comments. For the non-programmers, when I say comments, I mean com bits of code that are ignored by the computer and are purely there for the people. So how do we write these comments well? This is something anybody who's done a course, you'll learn, you've got to write comments. But you, there's a litmus test. There are valuable comments are there and there are non-valuable comments. If you ask yourself, does this comment clarify why I'm doing this? Not what I'm doing or how I'm doing it, then it can stay. If it's just what or how, it probably means you could change your code to communicate that instead. I'll give you an example. This is a what comment. We can see here, anything that starts with a double slash is a comment. It says what this code is doing. It says calculates the, the price on the shopping cart. Because this by itself is a little bit unclear. What you could maybe infer from the fact that it says price, but what does T mean? This is a what comment. It means we should probably refactor to get rid of it. So a better way to write this is an implicit thing. You abstract what's called a function, which says, I can delegate this task somewhere else. So we delegate it to the delegate it to the shopping cart total function, and it gives us all the, for these items. And then we immediately know that T is the total. This is a very simple example. What I want to get across to you is this, this question, why not what or how? And you'll notice that I've deliberately made this orange, not red. It's better to have this comment, better to have a what comment in there instead of a why, but it's best to refactor. And there's one exception to this rule. If you're writing libraries or packages that someone else is going to use and someone else will use your function, then you want a what, packet, a what comment. You want them to know if you call my library, it will do this for you. This is what it does. I make this promise to you. That's the one exception for this. This rule of why only, it only, implies, it only applies to the implicit internal bits of implementation. Here's a slightly more um, in-depth piece of code. It's a bit code heavy. So anyone who, who programs, by all means delve in. There's a bug in the code, try and find where the bug is. Anyone who doesn't, I'll explain to you why this is a mess and why it's difficult. In here, we have some medical code that's got a hidden bug. And to step through it, it says, if X is true, if Y is true, if Z is true, then do something. But if X is not true and Y and Z are, and you can see it just becomes, this is very difficult. There's a lot of cognitive load, and that's because there's a lot of, of demand on your working memory in here. And there's a bug that if we, change the code. Nesting, I, I mean these like every time you, you move it in a level by opening and closing braces. If we collapse it down, we can make things a lot easier to understand. So now we can step it through and it actually reads like English. I can explain it. I say, get the response, 
of medications requested for the patient. If there's an error, return the patient. If the response says the user is, is not authorized, return an invalid resource error. And immediately we can see that that's where the bug is. Is user authorized and invalid resource have been matched up and the wrong fire resource and unauthorized have been matched up. By reducing this nesting, we reduce the cognitive load required on the person writing the code. And then we find these bugs. So for anyone who does write code, by all means, try and do this as best as possible. Return early. For anyone who doesn't, take this on board as it's, it's why when a software engineer pushes back and says, I want to write this properly, I don't want to rush it, it's to avoid simple errors like this. And I must give credit to this example to another Googler named Elliot Karpolovsky, who wrote an article that I'll put in the suggested reading later. So we've gone through some tips about clarity. Let's look at how we can improve testing now as well. Um, I'm a test nerd. Even my weekend code has tests written for it. It's actually, it becomes quite a rewarding exercise, but I, I appreciate that I'm a bit odd. So I said in the, in the description of the talk that the reason we write tests is not to prove that things work. In reality, the reason we write tests is because we have made assumptions while writing our code and we want to lock in those assumptions. We want to make sure that the assumption holds now, in the future, on a different machine. And what these assumptions can be anything. They can be someone else on my code, has, on my team has written some code. Mar Marcus has sent me something he's written. I want to, I assume that it works this way. I want to lock that in. Or one assumption is obviously my code does what I intended it to do. So all of these things get captured in a test and then they're locked in for perpetuity. And that's really a safety thing. If it's in research code, it's about reproducibility and reliability as well. So like there were pillars of healthy code, there are also pillars of effective tests. A test should be automated. Anyone here who, has, who writes code, I've done this myself, you start off by early in your career, you write a little bit of software, you print the result to the screen, and you say, oh yes, when I say two plus two, it prints four, therefore it works. I tested my code. And automation is the difference between saying, I tested the software and the software is tested. By saying the software is tested, it gets rid of the things that are specific to me. When I test my code, it assumes my machine, my inputs, my environment. When the software is tested, that is portable. That means it's safe to run those tests on the machine where it's deployed, on another programmer's machine, and we get greater reliability as a result of that. And that's what we want, particularly in medical code. The next pillar is coherent tests. They're very, very simple. At any cost, avoid adding logic. Sometimes you can't avoid that, but don't add logic to your tests unless you need to. There's the only thing worse then no test is a test with a bug in it. And the reason is that you get this false sense of security. You can say, Aaron taught me to test the code, the software. The software is tested, but the software isn't tested because your tests have a bug. If you keep them as simple as possible, then those bugs will be obvious to everyone, to you, to the person reviewing your code, and you'll, you'll catch them very, very early. And the final pillar is that, that tests should be thorough. There's different, there's a, a habit that people get into of just test things that work. Don't actually test the error paths. If we go back to that earlier reduction of code nesting, if we test the error paths, you'd actually find that bug. Um, so we have like a, a, a multiple level defense strategy here. People might know the Swiss cheese model of accidents. So we have testing and clarity. With all of these, we make this software safer for the patient. So we have thorough code for that reason. When sometimes you might see something called a unit test or an integration test or end to end, that's really just the scope of what's being tested. Unit test says, I'm going to look at this little bit of software here, these 10, 20 lines of code, check that they work. Integration test says, how do all of the pieces of the puzzle fit together? Does it look like the picture that's on the box? And end to end says, I'm going to stand up the whole system and actually run it in an automated fashion. 
there's this myth that tests are hard and that they're time consuming. And I would argue that, I don't even think it's my opinion, I would just argue objectively that tests, once you get the hang of it, are a very, very easy thing to do. No more difficult than other software is to write. And they actually make your, your life a lot easier because they reduce the cognitive load. Oh, I'm gonna change this piece of code. I know the tests are there to catch if I break something else. So with these three pillars, let's look at how we can actually achieve them. So the first thing is an informative error. When you do have an error in your test, something like this, it's very common you'll see in assert libraries that you say, assert that the number equals five, and then all that it prints out is expected five, actual seven. And that doesn't help anyone. That doesn't help another programmer solve the problem. Remember, another programmer could be future you. You're gonna kick yourself when you see this, and you're gonna say, I wish I'd done something a bit more. Or it could just say unexpected error. So we could improve this a little bit. We could say, we expected five medications, got seven. Okay, so we know what, the, we, know what we were trying to do, there's still not how we were trying to do it, or just unexpected error listing medications. Aim for things that are informative. You want your test, your errors to be as useful as possible. So this is when we said from the medications, list all of them for this patient, where PRN medications, false, don't want it included, we can see we've got a paracetamol, we've got some PRN medications. Immediately, we know from this message what the bug is. We know what we were trying to do. We know what input we gave into it, and we know what the result was. Similarly, when we were trying to list all of the medications, we could say that the error was that it was permission denied. The goal, the thing you should really be aiming for is, can I solve the problem from my test error alone? It's not always possible, but something like this, you can. And that's why I crafted this as an example. Another test, this is another code heavy slide, is to test the behavior of the software, not the implementation of it. So when I say test the behavior, I say, I mean, use some predefined examples. If we give it this input, we expect that output. It's very coherent. It meets point two of the pillars of coherence, easy to understand. There's no logic. We, we don't say, when I asked two plus two plus two, did the machine call the addition function? We just say, does it equal six? It's to the point. So here's a test that I'm gonna show you that tests the implementation and it becomes a tautology. So we have this abstraction that says, give me all the drug warnings for the patient and in return, give me a list of medications. These square brackets mean a list. So it says for every medication in the range of patient medications, then for every drug, in the range of contraindicated diagnoses for this medication. If the patient has this diagnosis, return it, it will, will return it as a medication. Seems like a fair way of doing it. A, an implementation driven test says, assert that the, the medications method over here has been called once, and then the has diagnosis method has been called n times, where n is how many, how many we expect. But this is a tautology. We've said, test that we implemented it the way that we implemented it. So if the implementation is wrong, then the test won't fail, but it's still wrong. That comes from testing the implementation. Another thing that this does is if we refactor our code, we still have this drug warnings on the right over here, but instead of going through all of the medications, we take a diagnosis driven approach and say, for every diagnosis in the range of patient diagnoses, and for every medication on the contraindicated list for that diagnosis, if the patient is prescribed the medication, return it back. These things do the same thing, but if we have this, we have, if we have this implementation-driven test, it fails, and suddenly it says your code doesn't work anymore, but it does work. So test behavior instead, this is a much better way of doing this. We say the value that we got was drug warnings for the test patient, the value that we want is medication zero, one, two, three. And if what we got doesn't equal what we want, print out an informative error message. And you can see there's a few different things. The thing to take from this is implementation tests don't necessarily capture everything. They break easily. Whereas behavior driven tests get straight to the point. Um, a, a Googler called Andrew Trenk wrote 
a, a document called Behavior Not Implementation, and he should get credit for this, and I'll link to that later in the talk. So in summary, again, this was the, the one message to take from this. Working code is good, but it's not enough. When you as a CMIO or as a, someone procuring software from someone gets pushback from the developers and you say, but it works, remember what we saw today about what the problems can be and keep that in mind. At the end of the day, really, it's patient safety that's at stake. If code is written well, if it's easy to maintain, and if it's safe, then the patients are safer as a result. If it's not written well, not only do we introduce risk, but we also introduce friction and updating medical systems. Everyone understands how difficult that is. If there is technical debt through unhealthy code, it will just take longer and longer. One way that we get there is with clarity. We reduce the cognitive load on programmers in the same way that we want patient handover between clinicians, we want code handover between programmers. And the best way that they can do this without having to sit with each other is reducing cognitive load in what they've written to improve communication. And the last thing is testing. We lock in our assumptions. You wouldn't release a drug to market without a clinical trial. Don't release your code without automated tests. Whether it's going to be used in a hospital, in a in a GP practice, in the field, or it's going to be just research code. There's no such thing as just research code. That research gets translated and that research gets used for real people. So put in your tests, please. Just some suggested reading. Um, remember the, the talk will be recorded so you can come back to the list. Coding Horror blog is written by a programmer named Jeff Atwood, and he has a list of recommended reading for developers. I won't claim to have read everything on this list, but I have a lot of respect for Jeff. He wrote something similar to the reduced nesting in one of his blog pieces. Everyone has a lot of respect for him, and this is a great reading list. Dave Cheney wrote a piece called Clear is Better Than Clever. It's on clarity and simplicity and why that's important. Anything written by Dave Cheney is worth reading, particularly around this. Martin Fowler similarly, wrote a piece on code. There's, you can look on the blog, on this website, about code smell. You can also look on Wikipedia for examples. Code smell is when you look at a piece of software and you smell and you go, something doesn't smell right. And it's immediately obvious, but you're not sure what it is. And what I'd suggest is if you come across this, trust your gut, look a bit deeper. It probably is something that can be improved. And Google has this thing called testing on the toilet. It's not related to code smells. I only realized that when writing this, but on the back of the doors of the cubicles are a number of articles called testing on the toilet. So when you sit on the loo, you can learn how to write better code. And they're in all of the Google offices around the world. There's also learning on the loo for non-technical things to learn. And we've published a lot of them on the Google blog under testing. And these are some pieces that I'd I recommend all of them, but these are some ones that I use a lot. I, I do a lot of code reviews and I teach style code style at Google and I often send people these. So one is called change detector tests considered harmful. We remember earlier in the tautological test of code, it doesn't actually tell us anything. All it does is cause people to start ignoring the tests. And if you think of alarm fatigue in hospitals, Change detector tests are very similar. The next piece I'd recommend is called Know Your Test Doubles. This is if you're really getting into testing and you want to put in a fake version of something or a mock or a stub. This is when you want to control the behavior of things that are usually outside your control. And each of these words that are used, they have different meanings and that's what this explains. We've seen the reduced nesting, reduced complexity, but that's a piece on there. There's a really good article on how to respectfully do code review. What do we want from it to make it best for everyone involved? The same piece, test behavior, not implementation. Um, delves a little bit deeper into what I spoke about before. And a final one, to comment or not to comment. My why versus what and how was a, a very simple version of that. And this jumps into a few different places where you can look at 
ways to comment and what they imply. I forgot to include my favorite thing on the list, actually. If you do a Google search for it, it's called Bumper Sticker API Design, and it just gives 10 or so points on how to make your API more readable for other people to use. I'd strongly recommend coming back to this list and having a look sometime. And that's that. So thank you for coming along. And if there's any questions, I can answer them. Marcus, was there anything while we were talking? Well, I was talking, sorry. Uh, there were a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, a very different kind of spin on the, the usual kind of webinar uh, topic that we would use in the faculty. And I think really welcome, actually, because, um, you know, although much of clinical informatics can uh, can be learned and, and much of it does not require you to understand coding, I think it's a little bit like, you know, if you imagine a, a clinical informatician at their, uh, at their best might be analogous to an, a, a conductor of an orchestra, that conductor still has to understand music. They still usually have to have proficiency on an instrument. You can't just be a conductor. And I think it's really important that we, you know, as clinical informaticians have at least some understanding that takes us down to the lower levels of what's happening, because I think it, if nothing else, going right back to the start of the CCIO um, movement, um, and uh, the, it helps us detect when we're being sold something that is not as good as it should be. The million pound chair is the example that's usually given is that, you know, if you, when somebody tells you, um, we've designed a chair and it has these, all these uh, features and it's fantastic, it's the best chair ever. And they say, it's gonna cost you a million pounds. You tell them, well, no, that's ridiculous. That makes absolutely no sense for a chair. But with software, unless you have a frame of reference for what costs money, what, sh what should things have, what features to expect and what features not to, um, it's very difficult to detect the, the analogous million pound chair in software. So I think it's really important that we, you know, as, as, as informaticians, always seek to include this kind of knowledge in our, in our knowledge base and certainly don't consider ourselves above it ever. Um, but because I have, you know, encountered that, that argument that you know informaticians need not know any uh, anything about code and software and design patterns and and architectures and things and actually i think that's not true so it's really good to have um have this perspective um we've got a couple of questions so i'll um go straight to those um there was mark bailey has asked which language were your examples in i think just for our general interest oh i'm so glad you asked that was golang I did it on purpose because I love the language. Um, for anyone who hasn't come across it, Go, I would describe as if C and Python had a baby and the DNA turned out perfectly. Um, it is strongly typed, which means you know that when you're dealing with a number, that's a decimal, it's called a float, you've got that. When you're dealing with a string, it's exactly that. It's very easy to, which is C-like, but it's very, very easy to write, um, which I would consider Python-like. And a lot of what I learned about healthy code and clear code, I actually learned from the Go language and teaching it internally. Cool. I've actually never, I've never programmed in Go. I use a lot of Python. Um, and uh, you're right that actually sometimes having to guard yourself against getting the wrong data in um, in a duck type language where you don't know what type it's going to be actually just adds more complexity to your code because you don't know that the data will always be of that type exactly and that's the cognitive load thing if you if you use strong typing um, it makes it easy you the computer takes that away from you you don't have to remember what's what it does that for you and it makes it easier and just much simpler. Um, you use the term duck typing for everyone else. That means if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So if you pass a number in when you're expecting a string of characters, it suddenly gets treated as a word, not some, like the, writ the written form of the number, not something you can perform arithmetic on. But if you have something strongly typed, you don't have to worry about that. We have somebody with their hand up. So Phineas Catling, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. 
thanks very much, Aaron. That was a fantastic talk. I, I wonder if um, you could comment on something, a problem that I encounter in my research, which is doing data analysis, but with stochastic elements, things like machine learning, when you're, you're not exactly sure what the data structure you're operating on is going to look like after you've, say, trained your machine learning model. I'm sure you encounter similar things at Google. How do you write robust tests for those, those sorts of situations? So I think there's something really interesting that can be said about stochastic code. And I'm really glad that you used the word stochastic because it doesn't mean that it has to be non-deterministic. The idea is that when you write something that has a random element to it, the computer doesn't use true randomness. The computer has to generate its randomness. And you, you, you have this concept of a seed. It says, if you start with this as your incoming seed of randomness, this is the deterministic output that will come from that. When you start to, so if you have a function that includes randomness, that is one way you can do it. Or remember when I said something about test doubles, you can, you can put in a, a randomness generator that's completely under your control. And it's important that you still have determinism in your code, even though there is randomness, because if it's not deterministic randomness, you can't tell the difference between a bug and what's meant to be. If you have, if you introduce, um, if you, even if you say it's been run many, many, many times, and therefore by the law of, law of large numbers, any variance cancels out and your, your variance must go close to zero, that only changes your precision on randomness. This doesn't change your accuracy. You can have a very, very precise output that because you had non-deterministic errors, it is just completely off the mark and wrong. When you start bringing machine learning into the mix, like you mentioned, that goes a little bit further outside the realm of what I was dealing with here in testing. It's like you say, when you don't know what it looks like on the other end, I think that is when you start bringing more traditional trial type things into the mix. Does this do what I intend it to do significantly better than other times? And I think basic hypothesis testing can be brought into that. And very, very occasionally, I think in my five years in Google, I've written two hypothesis test based tests that I just said, look, I don't know how to address this any other way. I'm going to make the test run a million times. Therefore, my p-value is 10 to the minus 8. And please just accept that. Thanks in a way, that's, that's kind of how medicine works. And, you know, when we do our research, we can't run the determinants deterministic tests but we can run it against the population and then analyze the population and say well you know we think that we found an effect and comparing the control and the intervention arms you can actually say whether you did find an effect or whether that effect was the one you want to find um yeah another if i may just add one last thing one thing you can do if you have a whole a machine learning model is it's like a pipeline so i spoke about unit and integration and end-to-end -end tests you can still put your unit tests in there this bit of the pipeline works exactly as I expect it to. Um, let's just go back and make sure I haven't missed any other questions. Um, right at the beginning, when you were talking about preventable error and you had the pyramid of uh, with four deaths at the top and 3000 IT um, errors, you said something about those deaths are preventable or the errors are preventable. And Mark Bailey has asked, could you define preventable from an IT perspective? Oh, it's tough. I'd like to. I think you can break it into two different things. There are some that are absolutely preventable beforehand because it was actually the software. And then you move into usability, which moves outside of you of the code itself is the is the way that the human interacted with the code preventable um enrico coyera um the professor of health informatics wrote something about like you can't test informatics in isolation and software in isolation it's got to be within the socio-technical milieu in which it's used and i think that is an element that is separate to what i was trying to address today the, the preventable errors that i was trying to address today were does my software 
work in the way that I intended to under those circumstances. And then the next level along, which is that, that first bit, I would con I would say is very much preventable, the errors there. It's the next bit, how do things go wrong when the different layers of Swiss cheese all miss things? I don't think those are as easily preventable, but this is just that first layer, it closes many holes in that first piece of cheese so that we don't let the errors kind of drip through further. Mm. Um, there's a question, should we be requiring health IT suppliers to publish their testing strategy and how do we get around commercial confidentiality? Interesting. I think that's a really tough question. I think, um, so Marcus and I before this were talking about like open source software and open source um, operating systems and that is it's a beautiful thing because you can look inside it you can verify that it works i think if a commercial company is it it's, it's a hard question because you do have that confidentiality mm -hmm. i think it really I depends on what's going on if there is something like a machine learning model then it can undergo the same kind of um, scrutiny that a drug can undergo. If you have to have code kept in a proprietary mechanism, then it becomes a lot harder. Um, I don't, I'm deliberately trying to stay away because I have no legal background and don't want to say anything about that. I don't know what things are available there, but I think that becomes something where you, you need to have an open discussion. That's when having a CCIO who understands tech can have an open discussion of why they want this, why they don't, and bring both parties to the table. I was discussing with Marcus before that I want my, my goal is to be able to have technicians and clinicians talking to one another so that they can come to some sort of mutually understandable conclusion so that they believe things are safe for everyone. Yeah, I think a really great, great term is, is um, shared vocabulary and having understanding of each other's vocabulary just enough that we we're now able to speak the same um, the same language. Um, I think I mean, my my personal views around testing and open source are probably quite radical, but I think one of the problems that it stems from that the difference between say drug testing and and open source software or software testing is the difference between patent law and copyright law. Um, so a drug can be patented um, and patents uh, provide protection for the originator of that innovation, but only for a limited time. Um, so that it means that a drug after it's after a, a drug company has extracted some kind of value back for the R, to, to pay for the R&D costs, they the drug then becomes generic. But we because software is a, a creative work and it's regarded so it's copyrighted and copyright doesn't expire in the same way as patent and um, this creates the problem where there is no such kind of analogous pathway for software and um, once software is proprietary it's always proprietary it doesn't drop off the end of a patent exclusivity agreement and then become um public domain and maybe there is an argument that that's something we could even though the copyright law doesn't and provide for it there's no reason why we couldn't ask for it and start to build that into some of the arrangements that we have with commercial suppliers and say yes you can have this is your innovation period you build some software you get 10 to 15 years of exclusivity but then afterwards it needs to be open source and then uh, public domain uh, means that we as the NHS for example as a customer we have access to the source code and we can continue to maintain that software if we choose or we could buy the new version from you if we choose and that becomes it's about being a more savvy customer i think there's some another angle that we can take on this and releasing tests to people requires that they delve deep inside them we do, the other mechanisms around quality control that are easier to to ingest to someone on the outside. The NHS digital clinical risk training, I think is very, very good. All the risk management that goes on around software, I think is 
in a situation like that something that that benefits everyone as well. It doesn't require that a purchaser delves through potentially millions of lines of code to understand it, but it does add a level of assurance that this is safe for people to be using. Um, another question here um, from the FCI chair. Um, what advice would you give to clinicians involved in dev projects who aren't coding themselves? Um, if I could ask what kind of involvement would you describe as that, like what is the input that that kind of person's having? Uh, so so you, you've mentioned the point about common language, which helps enormously in that setting. But many clinical informaticians might code for fun, but they're deeply working in projects where someone else is coding and they want to know that it's done well. They want to know what questions to ask, what sort of test they should be thinking about, not at the coding level, but how, how that coding contributes to the project and what risks they should look out for. I think it's really, I think that's a great question. Thank you. I think it's really important. So earlier, Marcus said that sometimes people say, oh, but the informatician doesn't need to know how to code. And I was going to say, that's almost like saying that the clinical informatician doesn't need to know anything about medicine. I think you need to understand both things. And as the, the informatician who writes a bit of code, dabbles, but isn't the primary developer, that is where you come in and you can say, I understand what good code, what good tests look like. You don't necessarily have to be able to write phenomenal code or write phenomenal tests yourself. You know what they look like at a high level, but with your medical hat on or your clinical hat in any type, you can then say, this is what is important to me as a clinician. This is what I want to know has been covered and is properly protected and is safe to use. And I think those are the kind of questions. And that actually suggests that there are I spoke about unit and integration and end-to-end -end tests. That suggests looking at the tests at a higher level. So the unit tests are probably less um, important to someone in that case. Integration tests of how do how do the how does the EHR play well with the the booking system or with the the drug management system? How do, how does that all play well? That becomes an integration or an end-to-end -end test. It's a bit higher. It's more abstracted away from the code and it looks at real clinical problems. And then you can do things like hazards assessments and how can this go wrong? And the thing I really like about when you look at clinical risk management is the idea that you can take that and say, let's make that a test. Let's make that an automated test. There's one thing to say, I've put a mitigation in place. It's also really beautiful to say, I can point to it in a line of code. I think that's where the informatician can come into that. Everything else, look at unit test coverage. What's the percentage of lines covered? I usually aim 70, 80, maybe 90%. Cool. Um, Mark Bailey is asking, I have trouble getting IT and clinicians to work together in my trust. I'm currently at a loss on how to move forward. Any views on overcoming this age old barrier? Um, Good question. Very good question. I think it comes down to trust. Uh, there's trust in many levels. There is an element of protecting one's turf, of what I would call gatekeeping. You're worried about multiple things. I'm worried as a software engineer about someone coming in and breaking my code. I'm also worried when I put my clinical hat on of somebody making me redundant in that respect. I'm my medical, I'm more junior medically. And so someone else can come in and perhaps do my job. And I don't think that's actually the case. I think you have two pillars. You have a clinical pillar and you have a technology pillar. And everyone needs to have a base in both. And then have, I was once told by a mentor, know your major. Pretend this is university, know what it is that you are majoring in. And that's why I lent into being a software engineer. She said to me, don't pretend that you are the clinician. By all means, don't ignore the fact that you have the clinical background. That's very important. But know what you are there to be called upon and then use that. Sorry, I'm getting off the, the thing of how you get people together. I think use that together of saying, 
you are the IT team, you are the IT team, you will remain that. You're not gonna have a clinician who does, like the chair said, dabble in code every now and then, come in and try and redo your job. And you say to the clinicians, by talking with the, the IT folks, you can get what your needs met out of the software and bring them together. One other thing that I would say from a purely software engineering perspective, this stuff's hard, it's very easy to break, and having a human in the loop is scary. I don't even like having experienced software engineers changing my code. I don't like even changing it myself. Um, and I think that is could be where, where some of the, like, for lack of a better word, turf wars are coming about. Um, mm. Shared vocabulary is one thing, but a shared understanding of what the end goal is is another. And I don't mean that in a fluffy kind of like, oh, this is beautiful, we're all gonna work together type of way. I mean, really understanding what it is that the other person is trying to get out of this. And it is difficult, I agree. Yeah, I think it's actually, uh, it's nothing to do with tech, the solution to this. It's actually about people and psychological um, yeah. theory, as it were, you know, very easy to end up in a situation where there is, where it's a fear dominated um, discourse that you're having. And so IT as the team will have fears about, um, you know, are you time, trying to take over their role? Are you going to bring in software that they can't maintain? Are you going to give them a huge headache? And you have a fear, which is that they're not going to let you do things and uh, and and a, a fear that you're going to be uh, told to go away and that, that the software won't get better. And fear based interactions tend to not work very well. They tend to be quite um, defensive and people take positions and hold positions too hard. So actually you need to turn that into more of a trust based um, conversation and actually move to a point where you can um, understand some of the problems and the, and the concerns that the IT team have, that's as the clinician, and vice versa, the other way around. So let them understand what it is about the software that you're trying to improve and why, but principally keeping the, the pressure off. So saying there might be a period where we make no progress, but we just gain trust. And that, that might take months, years even, to start to find ways we can work together find a small problem we can improve that we have mutual consent to say we do want to improve this and we can both see a way forward and um, interestingly that you know the, the the digital health networks have been a really important way of, of bringing together technical and clinical people and starting to get that um closer working um and i can't not i can't not mention this you name dropped jeff atwood and of course jeff atwood coding horror um, is one of the founders of Discourse. So he founded Stack Overflow and then having left Stack Overflow, he um, built Discourse and Discourse is the platform we use as our as our um, network. So I, I would be remiss in, as a Discourse fanboy if I didn't point out that that crucial connection. The thing you said about, um, about safety, Marcus, it points back to what I was saying about respectful code reviews. I would never have grown as a software engineer when I was a junior by not having respectful reviews from other people. And the same way, you, I don't think you can ever foster connections between IT and health teams without having that respect between the two. To know that everyone has assumed good intent, I think is the best thing you can do. Um, so we're coming towards the end of the hour now. Um, so let's just see, we have a couple of questions. Um, it's been really fantastic uh, to speak to you, Aaron, and it's been uh, we've got a, a lot of uh, people who come along who also feel the same. Um, let's have. Uh, there is a question uh, which I think might be best answered on discourse. So Neil Das Artik has asked, I'm a clinical researcher who has been coding for the last 10 years. After your presentation, I feel I know nothing about coding. Where should I start now? So perhaps there isn't time to go into that kind of detail, but maybe um, if you ask that question, Neil, on discourse and um, Aaron is on there, I'm on there, there's quite a few other clinicians who code and we could maybe try and start to di direct you to areas. There is also the links that um, that Aaron placed in the at the end of his talk. Yeah, um, that's great. I simultaneously am glad that you said that and a bit feel a bit sorry. Like I wanted to instill this thing of everyone can get better but 
it's not to say you don't know anything about coding. It's just to say there's nuance. There's so much, there's always so much to learn. Yes, it's like the musical instrument thing. Um, you can never get to a point with playing a musical instrument where you're so good that you can't learn anything else. Yeah, you, know, you can always get better. And I can, it's it's kind of like going to med school. Um, there's a lot of people who are at their F2 level in coding, and this is like how do you take it to being a much 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 better coder? Okay. And there's another question about user interface design and testing, which again, I think we've we've hit our time limit. So I think probably another one to bring up on the um, on the forum. But I think these are really useful and valuable discussions to have. Um, and I only wish we had more time, actually, because this is this has been fantastic. I'm so, happy to stay on after the talk if everyone like after the recording and the talk if everyone if anyone has questions. OK, right. Well, um, so if we uh, with that, if I just um, convey a vote of thanks from the um, faculty to Aaron for uh, delivering this talk, and we'll close the webinar there. And um, but we'll stay on for anybody who wants to continue discussing. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Marcus.